the Ashwings know Rel is going to die. Over a dozen of the grey pinioned carrion birds are shadowing his ascent, cawing their hunger and impatience. The sky above is reddening. Below him, the gullies and ravines of the defile are filling with shadow. He climbs on, dragging his exhausted body up a sloping expanse of barren rock, striving to reach the ridge line before the sun sets completely. His fingernails are torn and bloody, and his twisted ankle is purple with swelling. Teeth clenched, Rel pushes past the pain and keeps pulling himself upwards. He knows he has failed knows he will never reach the hidden tower in the heart of the defile, knows he will never get the chance to join the Sky Warriors and sail the heavens in their great starships. Yet he keeps climbing regardless, determined to look upon the secluded edifice before the end. At least then he will know if the tower is real, and not merely a rumor or a legend or a lie. The shadows below rail deepen, the ash wings wheel and flap, waiting. With a final concentrated burst of effort, he reaches the ridge line, the last of his strength bleeding from his burning limbs. Panting, he lifts his dented canteen to his lips and gulps down the remaining mouthful of water. Resting his back against the gnarled trunk of a dead stunted tree, he looks out over the bleak labyrinth of jagged rocks and narrow ravines he has spent the past four days wandering. The defile is a shunned, uninhabited land, claimed by no clan, and its pitiless desolation drains the will of the soul just as it leeches the life from the body. Still, Rel's heart swells with pride as he takes in the view. I made it this far, he thinks, as the ash wings begin to settle upon the tree's skeletal branches. He recalls passing the bleached bones of those who had come before him. I got further than they did. I got to see the tower. The tower... Rel sits up in alarm, his drooping eyelids snapping open. The sun is sinking and the hidden tower of the Sky Warriors is nowhere in sight. He tries to stand, but his injured ankle will not support his weight. The ash wings watch as he collapses, clicking their beaks and ruffling their feathers. Rel groans and grinds his fists against the rock in frustration. He would have wept too, but his body has no moisture to spare. He sees no tower sees no man-made structures of any kind, only pinnacles of broken stone rearing against the blood-red sky. A legend, then, or a lie. It no longer matters. Rel has neither the strength nor the provisions to travel deeper in. Death is certain, and he knows it, just as the Ashwings have always known it. I tried, Papa, he whispers wearily through parched lips half-heartedly trying to console himself in the face of abject failure, hoping somehow his long-dead father will forgive him for throwing his life away in pursuit of a rumor. He pulls his goatskin jacket from his canvas rucksack and draws it about his thin frame as the temperature begins to drop. Even though there isn't any tower after all, at least I tried. The Tower of the Lost Ones cannot be descried from here, boy. The voice is deep and strident, the voice of a demigod laced with a harsh metallic undertone. Rel starts in shock. The ash wings emit a chorus of irate squawks and take to the air in a flurry of wings. The Sky Warrior has materialized out of the gathering darkness as if he had been lurking on the ridge the entire time, waiting for Rel to arrive. The boy cowers against the tree as the black armored giant approaches him, terror quickly mingling with his wonderment. The sky warrior has no face, only a leering bone-white death's head whose eye sockets glow with a sinister crimson light. He glowers down at Rel as if in judgment, his inscrutable gaze seeming to bore into the boy's soul as he takes stock of every weakness and failing. Overawed by his sheer physical presence, Rel averts his eyes. He had not expected the Sky Warriors to look like shadow-shrouded monsters sprung straight from his clan's myths of old night. The ones depicted in his grandmother's ancient history book had all been wearing dark red armor and holding aloft great shining swords, each stylized figure the embodiment of martial perfection. Yet this Sky Warrior is nothing like them. He is like nothing Rel could have ever imagined. Look at me, boy! 
the skull-faced giant commands. Quailing, Rel forces himself to meet the crimson eye sockets once more. The sun has disappeared. The ash wings are gone. Darkness rules the defile. It is impressive you managed to come this far. The Sky Warrior growls in his harsh metallic voice. But you should have never entered this region, for in doing so your life is forfeit. The Tower of the Lost Ones is no place for aspirants. It is no place for any sane man. Why did you not journey to the testing grounds beyond the White Dunes? The warrior sons of the desert clans who desire to join the Charnel Blades must prove themselves in feats of arms, not by wandering about the defile until they perish from thirst or exposure. Rel swallows hard, finding his courage and his voice at last. But I'm not a warrior, Lord. I was a thrall of the Dust Jackals clan. My mother and I were taken captive during a raid when I was six. The thrall folk of the Jackals aren't even allowed to handle weapons. I only learned to fight with my fists. Then five days ago, my master Herrick led a successful raid on a Wind Reaver caravan. Later, he got drunk during the victory celebration. Almost everyone did. He was with my mother in his tent, expecting me to unload his Sand Rover like I always do. I stole it instead, crossed the ash flats at night and made it to the defile before I ran out of fuel. I'd heard stories about a hidden tower. How, if you managed to find it, the Sky Warriors would let you join their clan. I know I'm not a warrior, but I didn't want to be a slave for the rest of my life, so I took the risk. I had to prove myself worthy somehow. Rel's voice trails off and he dry coughs wretchedly, his chest hitching in pain. The Sky Warrior is silent, standing as still as a stone, a towering, contemplative shape in the thickening gloom. Please, Lord... Rel begs, his thoughts starting to grow disjointed, feeling as if he is about to faint. Can't you take me with you? I know I failed. I know I didn't find the tower, but at least I tried. Wordlessly, the giant reaches for him. His huge hands are also cased in armor, and his grip is both unyieldingly firm and surprisingly gentle. He lifts Rel and cradles him against his chest as if he weighs nothing at all. The armor plates feel as warm as living flesh, and the whole suit hums with mysterious technological workings. I'm so thirsty, Rel says with a sigh as his eyes drift shut, his exhaustion overcoming both his wonder and his fear. I know. So am I. Rest now. I will take you to my brothers. The Sky Warrior begins to make his way swiftly along the ridgeline, striding and occasionally leaping from boulder to boulder, his movements impossibly fluid, never once faltering or stumbling. Rel loses all track of time, lying limp in a half-swoon in the giant's arms. His mind wanders. He remembers his mother comforting him whenever his sleep had been troubled by bad dreams. He remembers his father hoisting him above his head and spinning him about, his bearded face smiling up at Rel as he squealed in delight. Then he remembers the jackal's night attack, the panic and the screaming, his terrified mother clutching him to her breast as Herrick stalked towards them, the raider's black steel axe dripping with his father's blood. Then the sky warrior lays him down, rough stone digs into his back. A soothing breeze brushes across his face. Rel considers opening his eyes, then decides the darkness is too comforting. He wants nothing more than to simply sleep. There is a faint hiss of depressurizing air. A deep breath is taken. What is your name? And what was the name of your birth clan? The Sky Warrior asks quietly. The metallic distortion is gone. The giant's rich baritone voice sounds almost human now. Rel. Rel of the Dawn Hunters. Rel whispers. He can barely bring himself to speak. Four days. Four days spent traversing the defile on foot, lost and alone, searching frantically for the tower in growing desperation. Even though he is no warrior, it still has to be a feat worthy of recognition. Perhaps the Sky Warriors will make an exception for him due to his tenacity and resolve. Perhaps he will be given a second chance. Rel of the Dawn Hunters, the armored demigod intoned solemnly. 
I shall remember it. Had Rel opened his eyes at that moment, his last sight would have been of the Sky Warrior's unhelmed face, his pale, angelic features marred by a plethora of scars inflicted by creatures more terrible than any monster ever conjured in Rel's darkest nightmares. The Sky Warrior lowers his head and bears perfect white teeth. His cold blue eyes gleam like a June wolf's in the newborn night, filled with a deep and abiding hunger. You had no hope of ever ascending to the ranks of the Charnel Blades realm. Yet there is another way you can serve my brotherhood. Be at peace. Your struggles are at an end. May Sanguinius' wings shield your soul on its final journey. And may the Emperor account you worthy to abide forever in his eternal light. Rel smiles faintly. The gentle words of the Sky Warrior's benediction suffusing his soul as all physical sensation begins to fade. Through the darkness, he sees his father approaching, his bearded face filled with pride as he holds out a hand. Papa, Rel murmurs as the Sky Warrior's fangs pierce his throat. He feels no pain. He takes his father's hand. Peace fills him. The darkness envelops them both. Chaplin Varsareth feeds like a famished beast. The distant stars watch coldly from their lofty abodes within the void. Nearby a lone ashwing calls once as if in admonishment. Beneath his battle plate the space marine's superhuman body shudders in pleasure, even as his soul cries out silently in revulsion. It has been so long. Rel's lifeblood, warm and full of youthful vitality, spills down the chaplain's burning throat, quenching the red thirst. Scenes from the boy's brief hard-scrabble life flicker through the Space Marine's mind as his omophagia fulfills its purpose, immortalizing Rel's deeds in the eidetic memory of a living weapon of war. Forgive me, father, for I know exactly what I do. Varsareth raises his head as the familiar scrape of claws upon stone reaches his ears. No hope, he whispers mournfully, wiping a gauntleted hand across his crimsoned mouth. He is no longer referring to the dead would-be aspirant lying on the impromptu altar of stone before him. The space marine straightens, glaring into the shadows, his hand falling warningly to the crozier's arcanum maglocked at his hip. Glittering feral eyes shift in the darkness as eight lost ones begin to circle warily about the altar rock, drawn by the scent of the boy's blood. They growl low in their throats and snap at one another as they prowl closer, their flesh hunger spurring them on. The chaplain reaches down and gently closes Rel's sightless eyes, thankful the boy will never learn the truth concerning the tower he had been seeking. Under different circumstances, he might have become a fine warrior of the Charnel Blades, Varsareth says, smiling bitterly as his bestial gene kin pace restlessly about him. Or perhaps he would have been numbered amongst your ranks and entrusted to my care. Still, he died free while striving to overcome his fate and become something greater than himself. A worthy end for a mere clan thrall. Uncomprehending, the Lost Ones snarl impatiently at the chaplain, their elongated jaws bristling with fangs, drops of acidic saliva burning holes in the rock as they draw freely in anticipation. Then, Kazvo, their alpha leader, approaches Varsareth, his head lowered in deference. The mutated neophyte is naked, save for a soiled loincloth and carries a battered gap-toothed chainsword in one clawed hand. Scars earned in scores of dominance fights crisscross his pallid skin and his left eye is missing. In contrast to the gene-crafted perfection of the charnel blade, he is a pitiful degraded creature, a grotesque failure of the insanguination process. Yet the sacred blood of Sanguinius runs true through his gene-hanced veins, bonding him and Varsareth as brothers all the same. Lost ones are hungry, need meat. Kazvo speaks with great care, his needle-like fangs drawing fresh blood from his tongue as he struggles to form the correct words. 
Incapable of standing fully upright, he kneels awkwardly at the chaplain's feet. Vo is well fed. Lost ones can eat now, yes. Varsareth rests a hand upon Kazvo's bowed head and glances down at Rel's exsanguinated corpse for a final time, sorrow and shame gnawing at his heart. Forgive them, father, for they do not know what they do. Yes, Kazvo, I am finished. You may feast. Immediately, the lost ones fall upon the body and begin tearing it to pieces with their fangs and clawed fingers. Kazvo quickly joins the feeding frenzy, beating his brothers back with the flat of his chain blade so he can devour the most nutrient-rich organs. Donning his helmet, Varsareth turns away from the savage spectacle, sickened and enticed in equal measure. Lines of biodata transmitted by tracker beads implanted in the back of each neophyte's neck scroll down his visor display, warning of elevated vitals and adrenaline spikes. He blink clicks them away and strides to a narrow spur of rock overlooking a wide valley, striving to ignore the wet cracking of bone and the eager rending of flesh. Night now reigns in totality. Echodaria, Omneria's solitary moon has crested the northern ridges, flooding the heart of the defile with a pale silvery light. The Tower of the Lost Ones dominates the center of the inhospitable valley, dark and foreboding. Confined within our twenty-two more genetically deviant neophytes the chaplain has deemed too blood-crazed or mentally unstable to be allowed to roam at liberty. No mortal clansman has ever found the tower, for Varsareth has been condemned to guard the defile until either death or the black rage claims him. Yet I am no better than the creatures I watch over, father. The floor runs too deep within me. Once again, I have disgraced your legacy and your name by the shedding of innocent blood. I am not worthy to be called your son. His hunger sated, Kazvo prowls to Varsareth's side, his guileless, inhuman features slathered in viscera, his thick, blonde mane matted with blood. Licking his jaws in contentment, he rubs his muzzle affectionately against the charnel blade's pauldron. The lost one is holding Rel's head in one hand. The boy's eyes have been torn out. Gritting his teeth, Varsareth struggles against the temptation to draw his crozius and stave in the neophyte's malformed skull. Kazvo is the most intelligent and self-aware of his charges, and has even mastered rudimentary blade skills. Yet his flawed nature cannot be redeemed. As his debased kindred squabble over Rel's remains, the young space marine hunkers down next to the chaplain and together they watch as Echodaria climbs higher into the star-strewn sky. Why is Far sad? Kazvo asks as he starts peeling Rel's scalp from his skull with gore-stained claw tips. I am not sad, Kazvo, Varsareth says with forced patience. I am melancholic. I miss the fellowship and camaraderie of my battle brothers. Lost ones? Our Vars brothers also. Kazvo reminds him, unable to comprehend why Varsareth would prefer the company of other charnel blades to that of the volatile cannibalistic neophytes. We are all great angel sons. It is not the same. We are not the same. The lie darkens Varsareth's soul further and his shame burns hot. Kazvo snorts, as if finding the chaplain's denial amusing. We are same, he insists. Va drinks blood. Lost ones eat meat. We have brotherhood. We run, hunt, fight, play, rest. We are brothers. Why is Va sad then? Varsareth sighs in resignation, his frustration fading. I am sad because I have been left behind, Kasvo. In my hearts, I yearn to be at Baal with the rest of the chapter, fighting alongside the Blood Angels against High Fleet Leviathan, redeeming myself by laying down my life in the defense of the Primarch's homeworld. I am sad because my sins have brought shame upon the Charnel Blades. I am sad because my penance has denied me the absolution my soul craves. I am sad because I am too much like you, brother. 
losing interest in Rel's head, Kazvo tosses it over the spur's edge and starts sharpening the remaining teeth of his chainsword against a stone. Emperor's foes come soon. Lost ones will fight them. Far drowns in blood. Be glad. We die together. Varsareth shakes his head, bemused by the neophyte's simple-minded certainty. The Tyranids are far, far away, Kazvo. There will be no fighting or dying for us. Not any time soon, we are- Not seen us! Kazvo snarls in sudden agitation. He thrusts the brutal chain weapon at the rising moon, a deep animalistic growl rumbling in the depths of his heavily muscled chest. His scarred body trembles. Var does not hear! Hear drums beating! Hear blades clashing! Var's old enemy comes! Blood flows! Much blood! Blood and skulls and death! Time staggers to a standstill. Varsareth stiffens in sudden agony, his breath stolen by pain. Beneath his war plate, old wounds that have never fully healed open up in his chest and right side, as if torn afresh by incorporeal claws. Demon-inflicted wounds that had exacerbated the thirst, leading to the fateful loss of control that had disgraced him further in the eyes of his brethren. Varsareth drops to one knee, his vision swimming, nausea twisting his stomachs. Blood runs from his nose and ears. His visor displays a riot of overlapping environmental alerts and conflicting health reports. It has been decades since the chaplain knew such pain. He catches his breath. He roars. The neophytes roar with him in empathic sympathy, a variable chorus of beasts. He comes! He comes! Kazvo howls in anguish, red tears streaming from his single eye. The slayer of stars! The render of worlds! He comes for skulls and souls! Death! Death! Reality contorts, twisting and writhing as if undergoing excruciation at the behest of thirsting gods. The very stones cry out. Then the stars vanish as the galaxy itself is torn asunder. Vah! The full moon is glaring down upon him. Yet Echodaria is no longer illuminating the night with her soft pale light. The satellite has grown vast and swollen, blood red and baleful like. The eye of Horus looming triumphantly over him as the talons crush his wings. He falls to the deck, bleeding and broken, looking up into the warp lit eyes of the one he had cherished above all others. But the War Master only smiles mockingly at his pain. With a cry of sorrow and rage, he rises and hurls himself once more at the unholy vessel his brother has become. Va! Something heavy strikes Varsareth upside the head, and the bridge of the vengeful spirit dissipates from his mind's eye as he slips through time from one nightmarish reality and into another. He blinks confusedly. Kazvo stands before him, fangs bared in anger. The neophyte has torn off the chaplain's skull helm and hit him with it hard enough to draw blood from his temple. Two more lost ones are clinging tightly to Varsareth's arms, preventing him from attacking their alpha with their own formidable strength. Not time for bad dreams, Var! cries Kazvo, dropping the helmet and revving his chainsword to shrieking life. All must fight! Chaos is come! Release me now! Varsareth gasps out the command stifling the urge to kill them all for their temerity. The young space marines let go and draw back, their eyes full of distress. The chaplain lurches unsteadily to his feet, his armor's servo joints snarling in protest. A new world unfolds before his horrified gaze. No! The plea escapes him before he can fully master himself. He stretches out a hand as if he can halt the annihilation of all he has endeavored to safeguard throughout the lonely years of his exile through sheer effort of will. No! The defile is filling with blood. Raging rivers of Vitae rush through its canyons and gullies, converging and spilling into the valley in a rising vermilion flood. The Tower of the Lost Ones is slowly being submerged. Impossibly, Varsareth can hear the deranged cries of the imprisoned neophytes as the carmine tide engulfs the stronghold's base and surges against the walls. A torrent of crimson rain begins to fall, 
drenching all of Homneria in the liquid detritus of a galactic slaughter. Like a maddened beast, the thirst thrashes in the cage of Varsareth's self-control as the blood rain drenches his exposed face. The charnel blade begins to salivate uncontrollably, his canines aching as they lengthen. Dread grips his heart and he turns away. He must not succumb. Not again. Not when damnation lies so close. Is it not glorious, Varsareth? Is it not breathtaking? It is not what you truly desire. Rejoice! For now is the hour of rending and bloodletting. Now is the time of battle unceasing and slaughter and ending. At the sound of the Demon Lord's proclamation, the whole ridgeline quakes and the stones split. Varsareth looks skyward, eyes slitted against the downpour. Above him churns a shifting expanse of roiling clouds the colour of butchered meat. The stars are gone. Hell seethes in their stead. A great warp rift has been torn in the fabric of real space, and the horrors of the Empyrean are invading the material realm in a cataclysmic tide of destruction and madness. Loathsome, half-formed demonic visages leer down at the chaplain from the tainted tempest, before dissipating only to be replaced by others more horrific still. Agony lances into the space marine's skull and his soul reels under the infernal assault. Then fury fills him. The cleansing righteous fury of the angel betrayed. No, this will not stand. Not while I yet draw breath. Show yourself, Ascaraz Kanda! Varsareth roars as he draws retribution, his consecrated bolt pistol, and activates his Crozius's disruptor field channeling his fury into his ancient staff of office. I stand against you, as I did upon the killing fields of Daluth, in the name of the Emperor of Man and the Angel Sanguinius, I deny you this world. Depart, crawl back to the Skull Throne and report to your master. He will find no worship here. <laughs> the bloodthirster's contemptuous laugh all but sunders the stricken heavens. Jagged spears of multi-hued lightning strike at pinnacles of rock all about the defile. The Lost Ones bunch protectively together, growling garbled threats at enemies they sense but cannot yet see. The cosmic stench of the war assails Varsareth's senses, bringing bile to the back of his throat. Only you, Chaplain! The Unseen Neverborn mocks as the rain of blood increases. Where are your battle brothers? Those proud angels in red and black. The last time we met, three full-strength companies stood alongside you. Why are you now so alone? I am not alone, Chaos Filth. Varsareth retorts as a defiant Kazvo takes his place alongside him. The neophyte's naked skin now stained a bright crimson. The chaplain has no hope of outside reinforcement or extraction. The entire mustard strength of his brotherhood has long since departed for the Baal system, led by chapter master Sarova Cairo Saver himself, heeding the summons of Lord Commander Dante. Only a token garrison remains to hold the Charnel Blade's fortress monastery in the frigid snowy regions to the far north. Varsareth knows the venerable bastion must be under assault by the Demon Lord's minions. His remaining brothers cannot aid him, even had they wished to. So be it then, father. Your grace will be sufficient for the task. So, this is your reward for all your years of loyal service. To play nursemaid to your chapter's genetic rejects. A lifetime of selfless sacrifice undone by a single death. How the mighty have fallen. Your brothers could not wait to wash their hands of you once you had surrendered to your innate hungers. Your Primarch's curse festers within you like a poison that cannot be excised. What a perfect monster you are! The demon laughs again and Varsareth staggers back as if struck by a thunder hammer. Invasive memories resurfacing in his mind. Memories of PDF Captain Regina Hamiel struggling helplessly in his grip as he tore open her throat and drank his fill, while the Imperial city of Castamar burned around them. 
Let the beast dwell with the beasts, Reclusi Nikovac had proclaimed during the final verdict as Varsareth knelt before a tribunal of sanguinary priests and his brother chaplains, their collective condemnation searing his soul. Lifelong exile from the main body of the chapter had been decreed, for the Tower of the Lost Ones had been in need of a new warden. Not even Baal's desperate plight had been justification enough for his return, yet his brethren had been right to leave him behind. The Charnel Blades combated the thirst by adhering to a strict creed of total abstinence, and little mercy was shown to those who lapsed. The taste of Rel's lifeblood lingers, still savoured upon his tongue, proof indeed that beasts should dwell with beasts. My sin of self-indulgence was abhorrent, and my brother's judgment just. Varsareth snarls, refusing to allow the shameful recollections to weaken his resolve. Do not seek to turn me against my chapter, Demon Spawn. The flaws of our gene sire are ours to bear, not yours to exploit. You succumb to the thirst once, Varsareth, to your own disgrace. Then you succumbed again with the boy. Your weakling Primarch may have taught his sons to differentiate between the blood of the guilty and the blood of the innocent. Yet my master cares not from whence the blood flows. So long as it flows, you are more a true son to him than you are to the slaughtered angel. Blood is all you want, Vasareth. And blood is all you care to want. So it is with your entire accursed gene line. You know this in your hearts. Why struggle against a hunger you can never hope to be freed from? Pledge your soul to Khan, and the blood of the galaxy shall be yours! A wave of insidious visions assails Varsareth. Flashing glimpses of the future awaiting him, should he renounce his oaths to the Emperor and Sanguinius. He sees himself slaughtering the Lost Ones in a whirlwind of violence, before kneeling and offering the Demon Lord Kazvo's severed head as a show of fealty. You have already murdered the degenerate by blows in your hearts time and again. Claim their skulls now and free yourself from the strangling chain of servitude that binds you. He beholds himself imbued with the Blood God's unquenchable fury and boundless strength, standing victorious within the Fortress Monastery's Grand Reclusium, his uplifted hands red and dripping with the Vitae of the Charnel Blade's garrison force. The mutilated bodies of murdered battle brothers heaped upon the profaned High Altar. Your own brotherhood exiled you to live out your days amongst subhuman beasts. Why not remind them what it truly means to be one? For who amongst them knows better than you? Drums beat. Blades clash. The innumerable armies of corn muster beneath bleeding skies, preparing to sweep across the galaxy in an opposable tide of carnage and conquest. Varsareth fights at the forefront of one great host, drenched in gore and bellowing praises to the Skull Throne with each swing of his Crozius as his foes break before his onslaught, free at last to slake his bloodlust for all eternity, untroubled by restraint or guilt. For there is only war! As Karaz Kandar roars in empiric exultation as the chaplain falls to his knees, frothing at the mouth and gnashing his teeth. The alluring promises of everlasting battle and bloodshed in Korn's name, causing the angel and the beast bound within the very fiber of his genetic life code to contest with the dominion of his soul. There is only blood for the blood god, only skulls for the skull throne. The stars will drown in the blood of the Anathema's dying Imperium. It has already begun. I shall conquer this planet and refashion it into a demon world worthy of the eternal glory of Khorne. Bow down to me, Varsareth, and I will raise you up as its new lord! Blood is all Varsareth can see, all he can smell, all he can taste. 
Blood rains down upon his armored form. Blood runs from his worsening wounds. Blood seeps up through the rents and splits in the rocks beneath him. His homeworld is being remade by the corrupting defilement of chaos. A full-scale demonic incursion is imminent. The galaxy is screaming. His battle brothers are dying. The thirst is rising, clawing at his sanity and eating away at his defenses like a corrosive acid. The hunger, the pain, and the shame entwine and become as one within his hearts. Vasareth weeps, and blood taints his tears. O oh, father, why have you forsaken me? Then a firm hand grips the chaplain's pauldron and pulls him to his feet. The clawed hand of a creature who is both a beast and a brother. We defy you! Kazvo cries, brandishing his chainsaw challengingly at the seething hellscape above. Behind him the seven lost ones roar and howl in support of their alpha. We are sons of great angel! We are brothers! The blood-soaked neophyte proclaims proudly. We defy you forever, never born! Come fight us! So be it! Let angel strive against demon for the delight of the blood god! And in a tide of teeth and talons and bloodthirsty blades, the demons of corn descend upon them, flooding into the material plane like arterial blood spilling from a mortal wound, their desire for skulls and souls spurring them towards the gathered space marines with frenzied abandon. The vanguard is comprised of screaming bloodletters and baying flesh hounds. Varsareth does not wait for their onslaught and countercharges. The enraged lost ones at his heels, Kazfo still at his side, matching his pace stride for stride. For Sanguinius! For the Emperor! Death! Death! The first bog round to speed from the prayer etched muzzle of retribution flies straight between the gaping jaws of a bloodletter and detonates within its skull, rupturing its horned head in a shower of ectoplasmic gore. With a wordless war cry, Kazfo decapitates a lunging flesh hound with his chainsword as the mutated neophytes clash with the hellish canids in a slashing storm of fangs and claws. Varsareth knows there can be no victory, no future for him or his world beyond this moment. Yet he fights on with all the fury and skill his Astartes birthright demands, reveling in the ecstasy of pure combat. Each bolt round finds its final home within a diabolical skull until Retribution's magazine clicks empty, and each strike of his energized crozier shatters warp forged steel and discorporates unnatural demon flesh alike. Yet the foe is without end. Time has become a meaningless concept. One by one, the lost ones are overcome, their hulking bodies ripped apart by ravening flesh hounds or run through by the hell blades of the bloodletters. With each death, Kazvo grows more desperate and undisciplined. A roaring herald of corn astride a bellowing brazen juggernaut charges into the fray, wielding a monstrous battle axe ablaze with scarlet warp fire. Casting aside his chainsword, Kazvo drops down on all fours and launches himself over the juggernaut's lowered head as the beast bears down on him, his jaws wide, his claws extended for the herald's throat. The huge demon laughs and shoots out an arm, seizing Kazfo mid-leap by his blood-matted mane. It swings its axe once, and the snarling neophyte is hewn in half at the waist. Brother Kazfo! Varsareth's furious shout rises above the screams of the bloodletters and the howls of the flesh hounds. The Herald of Corn raises the young space marine aloft, even as Kazfo claws uselessly at its wrist. The demon grins licks its lips and draws back its axe. Kazvo! Kazvo ceases struggling. His arms go limp. He twists his head and looks at Varsareth. Their eyes briefly lock. The neophyte's eye is bright and clear and filled with a peace that surpasses Varsareth's understanding. Father! Blood gushes from Kazvo's mouth. The chaplain strains to catch his final words. He comes, Va. He comes. The Emperor's son comes! The Herald of Corn sneers and swings its axe, beheading Kazvo with a single stroke. The demons chant the Blood God's praises and clash their swords as the triumphant Neverborn holds up the neophyte's head by the hair, delighting in its newest trophy. Varsareth fights down his grief and prepares to charge the Herald only to find the way blocked by a forest of Hellblades as the Bloodletters close ranks and advance upon him. 
forcing him to retreat until he reaches the end of the rock spur overlooking the valley. Now you are truly alone, Vasareth. Alone in every possible way. You see there is no hope. You see there is no salvation. I have spared you so you might bear witness to a mere fraction of a true god's power. I now offer you one last chance. Swear fealty onto Korn. Embrace the darkness in your blood and be reborn as one of his immortal lords of battle. His cup is inexhaustible. Will you drink? Vasareth shudders and is nearly brought to his knees as another wave of vision subsumes his fracturing mind. He sees the everlasting vigilance. The hallowed flagship of the Charnel Blades battle fleet, wreathed in flames above Baal Secundus. He sees Lord Commander Dante, chapter master of the Blood Angels, impaled upon the upraised bone sword of a swarm lord. He witnesses the extinction of entire chapters of Sanguinius' lineage, thousands of brothers lost to the predations of the Tyranid and the Demon. Despair fills Varsareth's hearts like a black bile, and the temptation to surrender grows ever stronger. Then he beholds one final sight, the last thing Kazvo had witnessed just before his death. He sees and understands. Hope kindles anew within his heart. His sight clearing, the chaplain gazes with quiet contempt at the ranked bloodletters trapping him upon the spur. No, I will never serve you or your murderous master. I am a son of the great angel and I shall die as one. There is still hope. As long as the chapters of the blood endure, they will forever stand against you and all your blasphemous kind. My time is finished. I go now to my father. Skulls rain down from the heavens and the neverborn exult as Askar Askandar begins to tear his way into real space. With slow, contemptuous deliberation, Varsareth turns his back on the emerging greater demon. Rivers of blood are still pouring into the valley below, and the Tower of the Lost Ones is halfway submerged. Hideous serpentine warp beasts thrash and sport in the Vitae, their glistening barb-scaled forms circling about the tower, inexorably drawn to the souls of the neophytes trapped within. Varsareth closes his eyes and spreads his arms. Lord Emperor, Father Sanguinius, I confess my unworthiness. I am unfit to stand in your name. My blood is weak. My victory is failures. In death, I repent. The Space Marine jumps. Gravity takes hold. The boiling skies are torn asunder as Azkar Askandar screams in outrage at being denied the brief satisfaction of a second confrontation. Titanic wings beat the blood-thick air in futile pursuit. Eyes shut and arms still outspread, Varsareth falls, clinging to the memory of the final vision for as long as sanity allows. The vision of a giant warrior clad in cobalt blue armor haloed in golden light and wielding a flaming sword. Varsareth falls. The valley of blood rushes up to meet him. Beyond the tempest, the Secatrix Maledictum seethes across the tortured firmament, heralding the beginning and the end of an age. The son of the angel falls, and a final communion is sought. The death memories of his Primarch consume him. A terminal roar of rage rips free of his throat as Horus bursts up from the Vermilion Sea like a leviathan rising from the deeps. The War Master's arms are also spread wide, and at long last Varsareth finds peace in the welcome embrace of absolution. <laughs>